the title of tonight's talk, Wanting Peace, Living Hate. Actually, this is based on a dialogue between the Buddha and Sakka. You know who is Sakka? Tikong. Sakka, the king of Devas, came down to see the Buddha one day and he asked him a lot of questions. One of the questions he asked is about wanting peace. Let me read to you what Bhikkhu Bodhi has translated. I might change some of his words to make it easier for you to understand. Sakka, the ruler of the Devas, asked the Blessed One, Beings wish to live without hate, without harming, hostility or enmity. They wish to live in peace, yet they live in hate, harming one another, hostile and as enemies. By what fetters are they bound, sir, that they live in such a way? Unquote. So what Sakka Tikong is trying to say is that you know, everybody wants peace. They want to live without enmity, without harming, without hostility. And yet they end up living in hate, hating one another. What's the problem? You know, what's the cause? What's the reason? What are they bound? What factor binds them to not get what they want? And here's the Buddha's answer. Ruler of the Devas, it is the bonds of envy and niggardliness to paraphrase in an easier way that you can understand. It is the bonds of jealousy and stinginess that bind beings so that although they wish to live without hate, hostility or enmity and to live in peace, yet they live in hate, harming one another, hostile as in enemies. This was the Blessed One's reply and Sakka, delighted, exclaimed, So it is, Blessed One, so it is, Fortunate One. Through the Blessed One's answer, I have overcome my doubt and gotten rid of uncertainty. Then Saka, having expressed his appreciation, asked another question. But, Bhante, what gives rise to jealousy and stinginess? What is their origin? How are they born? How do they arise? When what is present, do they arise? And when what is absent, do they not arise? Unquote. So, Sakka is now asking the Buddha, what is the cause of jealousy and stinginess? What is the cause and condition why there is jealousy and stinginess? Now, what is the reason? Because of what does jealousy and stinginess arise? Then the Buddha answered, Jealousy and stinginess, ruler of the devas, arise from liking and disliking. This is their origin, this is how they are born, how they arise. When these are present, they arise. When these are absent, they do not arise. But sir, what gives rise to liking and disliking? They arise, ruler of the devas, from desire. And what gives rise to desire? It arises, ruler of the devas, from thinking. When the mind thinks about something, desire arises. When the mind thinks of nothing, desire does not arise. But sir, what gives rise to thinking? Thinking, ruler of the devas, arises from elaborated perceptions and notions. When elaborated perceptions and notions are present, thinking arises. When elaborated perceptions and notions are absent, thinking does not arise. Unquote. This comes from the Diga Nikaya, the long discourses of the Buddha, Sutta number 21. It's a very long discourse, and this is just a short excerpt from the whole discourse. But it's very interesting because it has relevance to us. Because everybody wants to live in peace. Right, not? We don't want to harm people, we don't want to have enemies, and yet we end up having enemies. Uh, we end up having anger and harboring hostility towards other people. So you can see that this whole series of cause and condition, 
Although you want peace, you cannot get peace. You end up being hostile and having enemies. What's the reason? Because of jealousy and stinginess. And what's the cause of jealousy and stinginess? Liking and disliking. What's the cause of liking and disliking? Desire. What's the cause of desire? Thinking. What's the cause of thinking? Perceptions. Okay, let me explain. The last one is very complicated. Bhante Bhikkhu Bodhi translated it as elaborated perceptions and notions. It comes from the Pali word, compound word, Papancha Sanya Sankha, which I will explain later. And there are various ways of actually translating this compound word. But it's very important because it's the root cause of everything. Yeah? Alright, let's look at why does jealousy and stinginess cause enemies? Why are you jealous? What's the difference between jealousy and stinginess? Actually, they're very closely related. That's why these two are paired. You're jealous because you don't like the success of other people. Isn't it? Yeah, people are successful and you are not as successful, so you don't like it. So there's actually an aversion towards other people's success. And that is jealousy. What is stinginess or miserliness? Stinginess or miserliness is the other way around. It's not wanting to share what you have with others. One is connected with the success of others, the other is connected with your own success or whatever that you have, you don't want to share with other people. Then other people are successful, you don't want to share their joy with them. So they are very closely related. What is the antidote? What is the antidote of jealousy? The third Brahma Vihara, which is sympathetic joy. When we see somebody successful, then we should say sadhu, sadhu, rejoice rather than compare with them and say, oh, he or she doesn't deserve that, I'm better, and so forth. When you compare like that, then you generate unwholesome mental states and also bad karma. And on account of jealousy, then you will create enemies. Isn't it? This is very common in the world, particularly when you are trying to climb up the corporate ladder or you're trying to get promotion wherever you're working, there are always people talking about office politics. Why not people trying to undermine your efforts to climb up the ladder? i tell you one interesting story. One of my childhood friends. We were friends from primary until university. Very long time friends. Not really friends uh, because although we stay in the same village, he's a gangster when he was a kid. <laughs> he was really a taiko, you know, even when he was a kid. And he was a great fighter. He was very intelligent, but maybe he grew up in the environment like that. The environment forced him maybe to become a gangster. But when he was in Form 6, he fell in love with a girl who was a top student, straight A's, and she had an influence on him. He worked very hard until he got to university, he got his PhD and became a professor of pharmacy. <laughs> okay, he was a professor of pharmacy. The, the girl, his wife, became a doctor. Anyway, being a Chinese and holding a post in USM, Malaysia, there are a lot of problems. No matter how smart you are, it's difficult to climb up. To get even an associate professorship is not easy. Right? So one day he was going through application for promotion. And then somehow or other, somebody from the staff, one of his colleagues, sabotaged him, went to see the boss and complained about his behavior. Then the boss called him up and asked him about it. And then he denied it. And he was very angry. And he wanted to know who it was. Uh, being a gangster in the past, he wanted to take revenge. So what he did was, he went to see one of his friends. And this friend is a psychic. Psychic in the sense that he could actually communicate with other beings. He went to consult him on this. 
and his friend told him that there is this room and there is this long table and that person is sitting there and she is like that, like that, like that. This guy has never been to that place before and never seen that lady before. When he heard this description, he was shocked because that was the last person that he would think would sabotage him because she was always very nice and uh, complying in front of him because she also had a stake in it. I think she also was wanting to climb up the ladder. His friend warned him and said, Daddy B, don't take revenge. When he wanted to take revenge, do something nasty to her. So, you see, out of jealousy, one can do all sorts of things. Then that's why he create enemies. Yeah, but luckily, his friend was able to pacify him and ask him to let go. Okay, so that's how jealousy creates enemies. Now, talking about miserliness, stinginess, that also can create hostility. Even if you're a student in school, you go for lectures and you're very good at listening to what the lecturer is saying and taking down a lot of notes. Particularly if the lecturer is a foreigner and many people cannot understand the accent, cannot understand what's going on. So if you take a lot of notes, some people will ask, let me, la, let me go back and copy, let me go back and photo step. <laughs> So these sort of things happen, isn't it? Even when you are working and you are attending certain courses for promotion, people also try to borrow notes from you. And then, if you are stingy, or you don't want to share what you have with others, then you give also excuses, not wanting to lend your notes to them to copy. That also will create enmity, isn't it? People don't like you. You are selfish. Why is it you don't want to lend your notes? Because you are afraid that the other person might get better results than you. <laughs> right? Okay, so there's also another problem. And in our scriptures, or rather in the suttas also, it talks about various types of stinginess. Even among monks, we have stinginess, stingy monks. <laughs> there are actually five types of stinginess. First one is with regard to dwelling. There's one story of one particular monk, I think his name is Sudama. One of the lay disciples supposed to be quite a highly attained lay disciple. He has built a few kutis in his own land and he sort of invites monks to come and stay. So he has this resident monk who has been staying here for some time. His name is Venerable Sudama. And because he has been staying there for some time, so he sort of expects his benefactor, I think his name is Chitta, to inform him if he wants to invite any other monk to come and stay. But the benefactor did not inform him. I think he went to invite Venerable Sariputta and some very famous monks to come and stay. And this monk got very angry and went to confront him and say very nasty things to this day benefactor. He doesn't want other monks to come because he doesn't want to share his authority or his influence with other monks. If other monks are better than him and they come, they might get the favor of the benefactor and then he will not be so favorable to him. And this also happens very often even nowadays. Some monks are very afraid of other monks coming, particularly if these monks are very eloquent, they can give good Dhamma talks or they're very charismatic. They're afraid that they might take away their supporters. <laughs> yeah, we have monks like that. So this is one type of stinginess. It's the same also in the office when the new staff comes and then you're afraid that he might climb up the ladder faster than you. You also try to not to help him conceal information and other things from him. No, it's due to stinginess. And then when this person finds out a bit later, then you're going to create another enemy. Okay, so this is talking about dwelling. But just now I talked about this fear that another more influential monk might come in and take away one's supporters. Uh, that is also another form of stinginess. Not so much about the dwelling, but stinginess regarding your supporters. This is very prevalent also among teachers nowadays. Teachers tend to become very cultish. They want their disciples, they want their supporters only to follow their way and they don't want them to go and mix with others. So that is also a form of stinginess. Then the third type of stinginess is with regards to gains. 
whatever gains that you have, you don't want to share with other people. Gains in many ways, either in salary, you don't want others to have the same salary as you, or you get very jealous about it, very stingy that they might earn more than you do, or get more than you get. Particularly for monks, because monks depend on people to give them things, right? Another reason why they are so fearful of other more influential monks coming into the picture is because if these monks influence their supporters, then their supporters might not give them so much gifts and might channel their gifts to other monks. So that's also another way, stinginess. Trying to keep monks away so that they don't interfere with their supporters' support. The fourth is also regarding one's virtue. Virtue in a sense of maybe good reputation. Yeah, you don't want to share the good reputation with others. You only want to be known as a good Dhamma speaker, a good meditation teacher. When others come, you see that they are getting better than you. Uh, then you try to do various ways to either defame them or to ask your supporters not to go near that other person. Then finally is the learning. Stinginess with regard to learning, with regard to the skills that you have. Like I said earlier, if there's a new staff that joins your office and you're afraid that he or she might climb up higher than you, you keep away information. Uh, it's the same with monks, you know. Monks also, they don't teach you everything. Uh, they only teach you some things so that they can be more knowledgeable than you or more skillful than you. That seems to be a very ancient Chinese culture. Uh, they say that when you go and learn martial arts or anything from your teacher, they won't teach you all. They leave a few things behind, right? So that if you try to be too clever, you know, they can, <laughs> they can still shoot you down. <laughs> but the Buddha never did that. The Buddha taught everything. You know, he taught without a clenched fist, without a closed fist. Whatever he felt that you need to know for your development and welfare, he would reveal everything. As you can see, with jealousy and stinginess, you can create a lot of enmity and a lot of animosity around. So what is the cause and condition for this? It's because of liking and disliking, isn't it? You like the support of your devotees, you like the gifts that you can get, you like your status quo, you like your reputation, you like all these things, and you dislike people becoming better than you. Now, it's because of likes and dislikes, that's why you have uh, stinginess and jealousy. You don't like that person's success. You can't stand that person being so successful for some reason or another. So it's due to all these likes and dislikes that bring about stinginess and jealousy. And these likes and dislikes also come from where? Stem from desire. Yeah. You want this, you want that, you want your reputation. And desire comes from thinking. That's interesting, you know. Why does desire come from thinking? And when there's no thought, there's no desire. This is linked to the last one, the primary cause of everything. As I said earlier, this interesting compound word, papancha sanya sankha. Papancha means proliferation. Sanya is perception, and Sankha means reckoning. So if you just put the three words together, it's proliferation, perception, reckoning. So how do you connect these three together? Well, you could say thinking comes about because of reckoning, which is a form of thinking. Reckoning due to perceptions. And where do these perceptions come from? Perceptions come from certain dhammas, certain mental states that are termed proliferations. Now, proliferation is a technical term that is used to refer to three mental states. Yeah, tana, ditti, and mana. Craving, views, and conceit. So, craving, views, and conceit will cause you to have certain perceptions. And once you have certain perceptions, then you start to reason out. You know, there's a rationale behind your thinking. And this reckoning 
due to perceptions, motivated by views, craving or conceit, will then trigger off all these thinking and then desire and likes and dislikes and then stinginess and jealousy and then finally a lot of animosity. Let's look at how our mind works. Where does perception arise from? The mind actually is like a CPU. It's a central processing unit. Whatever that you can perceive through your senses, they are all raw data. You see colors, you hear sounds, you smell smells, you taste tastes, you have bodily sensations. But these are all raw data. And when it goes to the mind, then the mind will interpret it. Interpret it according to its views, according to conceit, according to craving. That will also influence your perception. That will influence your rationale. Let me give you a more scientific account of how this works. I think I talked about this the last time I came. I just mentioned at the end of my talk about this professor called Dr. Bruce Lipton. In the 70s, when he started doing his research, he found out certain things that seem to contradict mainstream ideas about DNA and genes. Mainstream scientific ideas about DNA and genes is that our genes are all preset by our DNA and our DNA that we inherited from our parents. So it's all fated. We can't do anything to our genes because our genes are already pre-programmed by the DNA which is a combination of the genes of our parents. But he found out that actually that's not true. Genes are being modified every moment according to the environment. All right? And he breaks it down into cells. And he says that each cell has got its own brain. And the brain of the cell is the, actually the cell membrane. And each cell has receptors, antennas, you know, that receive stimulus. They receive and they also respond, right? So actually each cell has its own brain that can receive and perceive things. There are so many billions and trillions of cells in our body and each cell has got its own function. So certain cells have got certain receptors that can only receive certain things. Like for example, uh, the cells in our eye, in the retina, can only receive colors. Huh? The cells in our taste buds can only receive tastes. In Buddhist terminology, we say in eye consciousness can only see colors. Tongue consciousness can only taste. You cannot see, you cannot hear, you cannot smell. Right? So these are the antennas and the receptors that can receive specific stimulus. Now, it says although each cell has its own stimulus and its own brain, because cells form part of organs, and organs form part of the human being, the system. So they cannot have their own independent reaction. They have to respond to stimulus in a concerted way, according to the command of the central nervous system. Yeah. So they cannot do their own thing, they must do as a community. Yeah. So when a cell uh, receives a stimulus, it will communicate that to a neighboring cell. And then they will communicate, you know, very fast, uh, very quickly they communicate. So the cells will all communicate to the organ and the organ will communicate to the brain. All this works in many milliseconds. And how do these cells respond? It responds according to the environment. And the way it responds to the environment will also change the genes in the cell. The genes change not because of the DNA, but because of the environment, how the cell responds to the environment. Then he says, how you respond also will depend on the central nervous system. The way the central nervous system responds will be also due to your general environment. What he's saying is that environment in a very general sense. The cells, of course, each have their own very specific environment, which is maybe the liquid surrounding it, the plasma. But when we're talking about environment for the central nervous system, we're talking about 
whatever that we can perceive through our senses, whatever conditioning that we have gone through, through our education system, our belief system, the way we interpret things, the way we perceive things. Okay? For example, now, you are listening to me, and then you hear those sound there, the raindrops falling on the roof. Right? Can you hear that? Normal people would just ignore that. But the schizophrenic or paranoid schizophrenic may think that these are the sounds of people trying to attack him. You know what I mean? They are trying to attack him, trying to disturb him. I've got some experience with schizophrenics. I don't know why they like SBS. <laughs> we had one who stayed with us for many months. I took pity on him because what happened was that he had this problem when he was young and then the parents and his family wanted to take him to see a psychiatrist but he refused to go. So finally, because of his paranoia, schizophrenia, he had to leave his family. The family sort of disowned him or rather he disowned the family and he went around like a vagabond carrying a foldable wooden chair with him and all his belongings with him like a tramp going around from places to places. And then he would sometimes just sit at the side of the road, meditate. Oh, sit in the playground, meditate. He was a monk before. He went to Pulau Langkawi to become a monk. And then, after that, he disrobed and somehow he landed up in SBS. And he told me that he had to disrobe because the other monks were doing Gong Tao on him. Yeah. <laughs> doing Gong Tao, no? so he had to disrobe. And then he went to Thailand and the police were after him. So he had to run away. You know? All his perceptions are uh, all very distorted. Very distorted. After some time, uh, he would come and tell me, hey, you know, that fellow, I uh, think he's a detective. He's coming after me. Yeah. And if you were to suggest to him to see a psychiatrist, he would say, ah, you are also part of those people who are after me. <laughs> and I have to keep really very tight surveillance on him. Every day calling for interview. Every day ask him to come back to the present moment. Don't get lost in your thoughts. All these are just thoughts. Don't believe your thoughts. Yeah. Only and at times when he really tries to meditate, then you can see, well, you can see his complexion becomes very clear and his face becomes very clear and then he doesn't get carried away by the thoughts. But when he becomes agitated and he gets carried away by the thoughts, uh, then you can see he's a changed man. He can become very aggressive when he believes his thoughts. You see? So, that's why he says, what happens to our mind when we perceive an object? First of all, you just perceive color as color. Then how you interpret the color, how you interpret the sound, will then determine the quality of your life, isn't it? If you just feel that, oh, there's just raindrops falling on the roof, then you don't care to who's about it. Yeah? But if you think that, hey, that one is someone trying to get me, throwing bullets at me or something, uh, then you will feel very scared, right? And you have all sorts of funny ideas. And then you might even think, oh, it's a neighbor. Who else could do that but the neighbor? Next door only. Ma. Uh, then you start to pick enemies with the neighbor. Uh, all going on in your mind because you don't have anything, no proof at all what's happening. And you can really go crazy because of that. Another case is one of my friends. When we were in Form 5, he scored all A's. Went to sixth form, was a very good scholar. He was in maths class, also scored all A's in sixth form. Then we went to university, USM. But I think he went for education course in maths. At the end of the first year, somehow something happened to him and he started to become schizophrenic. He had this uh, paranoia schizophrenia. At that time, President Nixon was the President of the United States. And he said, hey, President Nixon is after him. And he did not open his mouth. If the moment I open his mouth, huh, they will bug me, they will take me. So he closed his mouth and you could see the frost coming out from his mouth. He did not open his mouth to talk to anyone. I went to see him in his house and his parents were very worried. And then the parents sent him to the hospital, put him in a psychiatric ward. I was the only one who whom he talked to, you know. Anybody else he wouldn't talk. He would just close his mouth and you can see all the froth and the saliva coming out from his mouth. 
Then I asked him, then he, that's why he told me about Nixon. Uh, he, then he said, I wouldn't tell to my parents because they wouldn't understand. You hear the crows out there? Uh, they're talking about me. The crows outside his house, they're talking, see, they're plotting against me, you know, they're always spying on me. So finally, they sent him to the psychiatry ward. I went to see the psychiatrist. She was a doctor from India. And they had to put electrodes on his brain to shock him to his senses. Because he was quite severe. Then later, they put him on medication. So he had to drop out of university, a top scholar, top student. Drop out of university after the thing during first year, even before the end of first year. But later, after my third year, I think he came to see me. At that time, he was really okay lah, because he was taking the medication regularly. And he dropped out of university and with his qualifications, he was a school teacher. Yeah. And he even got married. Just before I became a monk, he came to see me and he seemed quite normal lah, but he's on medication. Yeah. But this guy, this other fellow that I told you, the ex-monk, he refused to seek medication. He stayed with us for several months. He was acting in a very weird way and people were quite afraid of him. But out of compassion, I let him stay until something happened. So I had to dismiss him. Now he's back in the streets, don't know where. So, schizophrenia is a very acute case of how perceptions can make your life full of suffering. Yeah. So that's why we always tell you, don't simply believe your thoughts. Your thoughts are based on assumptions. Sometimes uh, assumptions in your beliefs might not be true. You know. So don't just believe the thought. You must look at how the thought is formed. Okay. Now, the primary cause of all these problems is the pancha sanya sankha. The reasoning that goes on in your mind due to perceptions caused by the three proliferations. By views, by craving, by conceit. I also got another student. He suffers from very low self-esteem. He feels that he's not good enough. Other people are better. That he does not deserve to be a monk. Because so many people are supporting him as a monk. And then he feels that monks have got certain standards. And he doesn't reach up to the standards. You know, this preconceived idea of what a monk should be. A monk should be mindful, should know how to meditate very well, should know the scriptures. but. I can't do this, I can't do that, I'm not as mindful as you are. It's time to compare with other people. And even though many of the other monks find him very hardworking and very conscientious and do things very neatly, even if you compliment him, he will say, no, la, you're just kidding. I don't, he doesn't accept, you know, he doesn't accept compliments. And he is a perfectionist. He wants to do things 100%. And if he cannot get 100%, he's not satisfied with himself. So you see, these are all due to also clinging, isn't it? Craving, clinging to the idea of perfection, wanting things to be perfect. If you cling to the idea of perfection, you cling to certain expectations which are unrealistic, then you're also looking for problems, looking for trouble. And this all comes about because of what? Because of misperception, because of craving, because of wrong view, because of conceit. What is conceit? Conceit means comparing yourself with another. Whether it is superiority complex or inferiority complex or equality complex. Same. These are all forms of conceit. The moment you compare yourself with another person, whether for better, for equality or for worse, that is really conceit. Because actually there is no basis for comparison. Now, each one of us is different. Now, we come from different backgrounds, different upbringing in this particular lifetime. And even in previous lifetimes, who knows how much we have studied, how much we have learned, how much we have practiced before. Nobody knows. So there's no point feeling envious because another yogi can do so much better than you. You can sit for three hours. Oh, wow, I can only barely sit for 15 minutes. So how can I ever measure up to him or her? Yeah, Or even if you can sit for three hours, that doesn't mean that you can look down on other people. Yeah, For example, you may be a housewife, first time doing a retreat. 
and then after two three weeks, then you get the jhanas. But then other renunciants, maybe a nun or a monk, may have been meditating for twenty thirty years, cannot even get the first jhana, cannot even settle their minds. Then you might feel very proud. Oh, I see. Me, I can do in two weeks. These people are, are still struggling after so many years. But well, then uh, you should ask yourself, if you had done so much before in the past, how come you ended up being a housewife? <laughs> huh? <laughs> uh, what did you do? Uh, there's one interesting case that I heard about one yogi in Pao in Myanmar. Similar case, uh, housewife, never done meditation before. She was quite elderly, came to the monastery, did meditation, could get all the jhanas, could recall her past life. Yeah. So she was wondering, how come, uh, I'm just a simple housewife, how come I can do so well in this meditation? So look back in her past life and found out that in her previous life, she was a uh, Sayadaw. <laughs> I'm meditating forest Sayadaw. How can a forest Sayadaw become a woman? Uh? <laughs> Well, I don't know how true it is, but anyway, she said that she saw that in her previous life as a Sayadaw, this elderly forest Sayadaw was very sick. And then there was one day devotee who was taking care of him, very devoted, taking very good care of him. And then she said that just before this Sayadaw died, he opened his eyes and then he saw this woman and he was full of gratitude for that woman. Just being full of gratitude and then he died. And then because she had this image of a woman, he became a woman. <laughs> I don't know how true that is. Huh? <laughs> okay, and then there's also another case of a Sayadaw who also became a little girl. Alright, this one happened in Burma also. This Sayadaw, he died and then became a little girl. But when she was a little girl, in the same village, you know, you know when she was a little girl, she did not tell anyone that she could remember who she was in the past. <laughs> then later this girl died. This girl died and then was reborn as a boy. And that boy can remember. Can remember the two lives. Yeah, the life as a girl and the life as a Sayadaw. And then as a little boy, he went to his former monastery. And then he could remember everything. He could remember all the things, the, all the belongings that belonged to him. And he could remember his students also. And he started to call his students by name. You know, his students are not sad all, you know. He called them, by, he called them as though they were his students, you know. <laughs> so uh, they were also very respectful of him. Uh, they sort of pampered him because he was so precocious as a young boy. And then he became a Samanera. They taught him some things, but he behaved as though he was the big Sayadaw there and treated the others like his students. So one of his former students is now a Sayadaw. He went to another village, another township. He heard about this case. And then he came back and he interrogated this young Samanera and tried to put him back in his shoes. He says, now you are Samanera. No, we are Sayadaws. You're not supposed to treat us this way. So he started to scold him. And then asked him, okay, you said that you were our former Sayadaw. Right? But then he calculated the death date and the birth date. He said, okay, the Sayadaw died at such a time. Now, you are how old? There's a gap in between, huh? 10 years. Where were you? <laughs> then he said, there was a girl, so-and-so's daughter. Lah. But she died, I think, of uh, illness lah, at an early age. Then the Sayadaw asked this uh, Samanera, then how come at that time, did you remember you were Sayadaw? Then how come you didn't tell? He kept quiet. Shy la. <laughs> he didn't say. He said only when he became a boy. But what was the reason that he became a girl? Nobody knows. He didn't say. Okay, so we don't really know what happened in the past. So there's actually no reason, no justification at all to be proud in any way. Huh? To feel proud or even to have low self-esteem for yourself in comparison with others. Each of us are different. Huh? We have to walk the path according to our own pace, right? Now let's talking about conceit, uh, talking about craving. Craving is when you have a certain thought, a certain way of thinking, a certain perception, one should not just cling to that idea, like I always say. Uh, you should question it. 
Last time I was here, remember, I circulated a book by Baron Katie, Loving What Is. Remember that book? Yeah? And what are the four questions? Do you remember the four questions? Can you remember? Oh my goodness. <laughs> Baron Katie is a very interesting lady, but I'm not going to go into a biography. Anyway, the thing is, if there's some thought that is creating trouble for you, there's some idea that you have, some pattern of thinking that you have that is creating problem for you. Like if you think, my neighbors are, they are very bad. They always do Ong Tao on me. Whenever I do chanting, they do certain things to me. How do you know they're doing things to you? You must ask yourself, when you have such a thought, the first question you ask, is it true? Remember? He said, of course it's true, lah, you know, when I'm meditating only, yeah, these things happen. When I'm chanting only, these things happen. If I don't meditate, don't chant, nothing happens. Is it really true? Second question. Any proof? Any evidence at all? Maybe not. You know, maybe it's because when you are meditating or when you're chanting, sometimes certain things happen. And you may not know why that happened. And it may not be due to an external source. It could be due to yourself. The question. How do you feel if you cling on to that thought? If you cling on to that thought that my neighbors are very bad, they are always trying to make me suffer. If you cling on to that thought, how would you feel? You feel very angry, right? You feel very upset, right? Because they don't have the right to do that. They should not do such a thing. They should be good neighbors. But how do you know it's true in the first place? Okay. The fourth question. What would you be or how would you feel without that thought? If you didn't have such a thought, how would you feel? Peaceful, isn't it? So what is actually causing you the problem is your thought, you know. You're thinking about what might happen when you have no proof at all. No concrete proof at all. So if you're clinging to that idea, to that view, then your suffering will not cease. You will keep on thinking about that and being very adamant that this should not be so. This is what happens in our relationships with our spouse, our children. Yeah, we have certain expectations of them. We want them to behave in a certain way, and they don't. And then, because they don't, uh, we keep on thinking they should, they should have behaved in a way. They should have behaved in this way. They should have behaved in this way. And because they don't, you keep on thinking that way. You keep on harboring that thought. Are you not causing suffering to yourself? You are, isn't it? <laughs> well, you have to be realistic. Sometimes. You know, you have to understand that they cannot behave in the way that you want them to. Then somebody was asking me, in that case, uh, to what extent do we let go of our responsibility? Just because they don't want to listen to us, we just let them be and let them do whatever they want? Huh? So there are two extremes. Uh. One is that you want to control them 100%. The other one is, since you cannot control them, you let them lose 100%. Also cannot, right? So you need to have wisdom as well as compassion, right? Wisdom to do the right thing at the right time. Wait for the person to be in the right mood or to create conditions for the person to be in the right mood and to say the things not in an authoritative way but maybe in a suggestive way, in a kind, suggestive way. The Buddha talks about this in a sutta called Vaja Sutta. He says, there are certain conditions for beautiful speech. Okay, one is that what you're going to say should be true. Yeah. And number two, it must be beneficial. Number three, it must be said at the right time, not when the person is in a bad mood. And it must be said in a nice way. And finally, with loving kindness. If these five factors are there, then there's beautiful speech. So if you try to teach your children, although there's compassion, like you want your children to be good, you want them to grow up to be good children, to be independent, to be able to take care of themselves. 
But sometimes when you say it, you are saying it out of anger, right? Not not really with loving kindness, with impatience and with anger, and not in a nice way. So this is not beautiful speech. <laughs> it may be true, it may be beneficial, but you didn't say it nicely, right? You didn't say it at the right time, and you didn't say it with loving kindness and compassion. <laughs> Easier said than done, because I'm not a parent. <laughs> but who says I'm not a parent? How many kids you got? I got so many children, oh. some more big ones, <laughs> and a lot of grandchildren as well. <laughs> okay, so if you look at this whole round of dependent origination that ends up in living in hostility and animosity, it all stems from what? Yeah, stems from your perceptions, right? Not from the way you reason out based on your perceptions, and your perceptions are caused by three things: your craving, by your views, and by your conceit. If you can get to the root of it, nah, go and check, nah, check and see whether the perceptions that you hold, the rationale that you are clinging to, it comes from certain perceptions, and that perceptions come from views, craving, and conceit. So you check and see, check your mental state. Okay, what is your mental state? Is there clinging to a view there? Yeah, is there conceit? Am I comparing to somebody? Is it because of ego? He doesn't want to listen to me and therefore I am angry. He should listen to me because I am the parent and he is my son. Yeah, these sort of things. So you must see. I have also a similar problem with some of my students. Sometimes when they do or say things without going through the proper monastic etiquette, one of my students is by nature quite bossy, you know, quite bossy. According to monastic etiquette, when a senior monk already gives an order to do something to anyone, then if he thinks that he has a better idea, he cannot just barge in and say, oh, no, no, you should do this, do that, you know. He should actually ask permission from the senior monk. He uh, says, Bante, do you think that doing this in this way would be better? Uh, but sometimes he just jumps a gun. <laughs> And let's say I ask them to arrange the seat in a certain way, and then he would come in and say, no, 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 you should arrange it this way, this way, this is better. <laughs> and I could feel it that there's an ego involved. He's like, you know, not following the monastic etiquette. But I know that it's because of my ego at that time, so I don't say anything. Because the conceit is there. Uh. But I know that I also have an obligation and a responsibility to point this out to him, that this is not the correct way to do it. But that's not the right time to do so. Let him do it first. If I say it in front of everybody else, that will embarrass him, right? <laughs> so I let him do first. And later on, you know, I call him and say, this is not what you should do. If you want to suggest a better idea, this is the way that you should do it. Right? So maybe there's something you can learn also. Instead of hitting out at your kids at that time, you could wait for a proper time and call them and talk to them nicely. You know, it's easier to deal with kids than with people who are quite old already coming to become monks. Very difficult. It's just like you want to ban a young twig. It's easy to ban a young twig, isn't it? You know, an old twig, huh? you bend too much, what's happen? Huh? You will break. Huh? <laughs> so you need to have a lot of patience and a lot of compassion to do it. And these are my teachers. Last time when I first started SBS, I went to a Sangika Dana and I met Venerable Boon King, Boon Chen Fasa, from Hao Si Temple in Penang. You know him? Don't know, Boon Chen Fasa. Okay, anyway, he's a teacher of Kai En, Kai Yin, Kai Zhao, you know, all these Kai brothers are under him, and he's the main teacher. Kai Yin Fasa in Santa Wana started his center about a year or so before SBS. Alright, so at that time I met his teacher. Wen Jin Fa in Penang, in the Sangika Dana. When he was a young monk and when I was a Salmonera, we knew each other. I haven't met him for many years. I met him then and then he asked me what I was doing and I said, well, I just started a monk training center. Oh, he said, yeah, one of my students also started a monk training center, 40 acres in Chaba. But you all think it's so easy to train monks. They will train you instead. <laughs> It's true, you know. <laughs> it's true. 
But you learn, uh, there's a way of training also. You train them, they train you, so it's a mutual process. Yeah, it's a mutual learning. Now, actually, when you want to teach the Dhamma also, you are learning. Actually, you learn much more when you try to teach the Dhamma to others. I think if you are school teachers, you will know, isn't it? Right? If you just read by yourself, uh, you can just chin chai chin chai, you know. If you want to teach others, you have to make sure that what you teach is correct. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, so coming back to watching the mind. So it's so important, as I've always been trying to say, you must always learn to watch the mind. After all, your five senses are useless without your mind. And it's your mind that does all the interpretation. Right? So before you latch on and cling on to a particular way of thinking, a pattern of thought, a reasoning, a rationale, or an interpretation, or a view, don't simply believe it. Take it with caution. Yeah? Understand how this comes about. It is only a view, it is only an assumption, it is only an expectation, it is not verified yet. It may be wrong, it may change in the future when we have more information. Right? So if you are cautious, then you can be more humble and you are less assertive, less arrogant. It's easier to do that, you know, because if you do not remember to do that, then there's a tendency for you to be assertive. And once you're assertive and you involve the ego, it's very difficult to change. Because if you think that it is my view, my idea, and if somebody were to challenge that view and idea, it's like challenging your ego. And then even though the other person might be right, you will not want to admit it. Yeah? But if you say that, okay, this is my current view based on what I know right now, and it may change in the future, then later on it's easier to change because you already made the statement before. <laughs> right? So be careful of the way we think. And it happens every day, you know, and very often. I'm just generalizing, you know, if I were to give you specific examples, I mean, you can give me more specific examples in your life, in your relationship with your family members or with your colleagues. So, although everybody wants to live in peace, they live in hate. Why? Because they believe their wrong interpretations, their wrong views, their wrong beliefs. So, be very careful. Before you latch on to any views, uh, check first and put it on hold, tentative. Okay, let me stop here. Any comments or questions? Yes. Okay. The question is, I seem to suggest that all these jealousies and stinginess comes from thinking. Yeah, shouldn't it actually come from craving or desire? Because Brother Wong says that he has noticed some very young children being very worked up because of jealousy, and he feels that young children don't really think. Yeah, okay. What do you mean by thinking? Uh? Thinking means conceptualizing. Here, the word thinking here is the English translation for the Pali word vitaka. You know what is vitaka? If you are familiar with jhanas, uh, yeah, vitaka is one of the jhana factors. It is sometimes translated as initial application, where you apply your mind initially to an object. Okay, so you could say it's initial thought. Uh, initial thought. But you see, a person will not get jealous unless there is this concept of I and you. Right? Uh, so the moment there's this concept of I and you, that means there's thinking really. If we were to practice like what the Buddha said to Malukya Putta or Bahiya, he says, in the scene, there's only the scene. Right? In the hurt, there's only the hurt. In the sense, there's only the sensed. In the cognized, there's only the cognized. What does that mean? Which means that when you see there's, in the scene, there's only the scene. Huh? That means there's no thinking about what you see. Just colors. Right? Now, because you're understanding the language, 
that I'm speaking. That's why immediately you can conceptualize. If you are speaking Thai, you will not understand. Is that right? Also, okay, what? You see, that is only a sound. Yeah, to you, it's only a sound. A sound is just a sound if you don't understand what it means. But because we conceptualize so quickly, the moment we see something, we already recognize what it is. In the first youth camp that I conducted in Taiping, many years ago, when I first started SBS, I gave them the use of mindfulness game. Okay? Several mindfulness games. Uh, one of them is when you take a picture and then you zoom in uh, until it's zoomed 500 times or what. Uh, then you cannot recognize the picture, isn't it? So you pass it around and ask them, what is this? The people wouldn't know what it is, right? Because it's just color to them, there's no recognition. Or you blindfold them, you ask them to feel something. Okay, what is that? You don't know what it is, right? So when you feel something, in the sense, there's only the sense. There's just no concept of what it is you are feeling, right? When you see something which you don't recognize, what is seen is just seen. Yeah, you don't go and label it and say, oh, this is a dog, this is a cat, this is a man, this is a woman. So that is bare awareness without any concepts involved. So the Buddha says, uh, if you are able to go to that stage, then you may be able to get out of suffering very quickly. But because most of us don't talk about children, uh, even animals, they have this concept of I and you, and me and other. They have what? Yeah, they have this concept of this is my owner, this is not my owner. Yeah, they no, the concept is there, although they may not have a language for it. Yeah, but the concept of I and you, I and other is there. So that is also thinking. Okay, and remember also thinking is not the last one. The last one is actually Papancha Sanya Sankha, which is reckoning due to perceptions caused by conceit, craving, and views. Okay, anyone else? Yes, uh, Lao. The uh, question is, Brother Lao says he's given to understand that people with unstable minds are not encouraged to meditate. Okay, it depends on what sort of meditation. I mentioned before somewhere, I don't know whether it's here or in Singapore, that there's one famous American psychologist and psychotherapist by the name of Jack Engler, who was also a very ardent meditator in the Mahasi tradition. Back in the 80s, in the early 80s, he wrote a paper in a journal called the Transpersonal Psychology, Journal of Transpersonal Psychology, where he pointed out that through his experience as a psychotherapist as well as a meditation teacher, you need to be somebody before you can be nobody. Which means to say that you need to have a stable sense of self before you can start the practice to realize not self. He wrote a very long paper, but I can just summarize to say that he says that uh, people who are suffering from psychosis, for example, schizophrenics and paranoids, they do not have a stable sense of self. They don't have a coherent sense of self. Their self is all discontinuous. There's no sense of self, there's no sense of consistency. Now, all of us have a sense of consistency, isn't it? We have a stable sense of self in the sense that we feel that what we were in childhood, when we were a child until now, although we are not completely the same, we are also not completely different, you know, there's a continuity in there. And then there's also a consistency in our behavior, uh, in our work, in the office, or in our relationship with people. There's a consistency. We sort of stick to this consistency. But... One of the characteristics of a schizophrenic is that a schizophrenic cannot write a coherent paragraph. You ask a schizophrenic to write an essay or to write a paragraph of what he did in the morning, he will not be able to write a coherent paragraph. One sentence will be about something, the next sentence will be about something else, and the next sentence will be about something else. He cannot connect it together because he doesn't have this sense of consistency in himself. And for such people, if they try to meditate on not-self, 
they'll get even more crazy. <laughs> and he gave an example of one of his students, you know, in university, who is on this borderline personality disorder. That means they are not 100% psycho, but they are not 100% normal either, you know. Sometimes certain things will trigger them off to become a bit psychotic. And then sometimes they are back to normal. They have this consistent sense of self. And sometimes it becomes very unstable. So there's one student of his. He goes between one extreme to another. Sometimes, you know, he will treat him like a god, like a great meditation teacher who understands the profound experiences that this student has, claims to have. Lah. And then sometimes when his teacher disagrees with him, then he would rebel and say, you know nothing, you are useless, and all that. For this person to contemplate on not-self would aggravate his disorder. In fact, Dr. Jack Engler maintains that Vipassana meditation is actually a contraindication for cases like that. People who do not have a stable sense of self, who don't have a consistent sense of self, you cannot teach them Vipassana meditation because that will make them even more incoherent. Yeah? But having said that, I would say that it depends on the severity of the case and also the intensity of mindfulness practice that you teach that patient. There's one Buddhist psychiatrist by the name of Dr. Pang Cheng Ka. I don't know whether you've heard of him. He is the founding president of the Malaysian Buddhist Mental Health Association. He's a psychiatrist in KL and also a lecturer in one of the universities on psychotherapy and psychiatry. He has been treating or seeing various sorts of patients who have psychological disorders. And he agrees with me to say that it is not advisable to ask a schizophrenic patient to go for intensive practice. But he says it's okay to ask him to do daily mindfulness, to come back to the present moment, be with your senses. Because that was also ground him. Uh. He would not get caught up in his thoughts about him, about his paranoia, about what is happening outside. So, daily mindfulness is okay for most people. But, samatha meditation or even intensive vipassana meditation is not advisable for people who are mentally unstable or people who are mentally prone to have hallucinations particularly so for people who do Samatha meditation. The main difference between Samatha and Vipassana is that Samatha, you try to attach to an object and maintain an object, not wanting to let it go. That's the whole point of Samatha, to fix your attention on one object and hold it there so that it doesn't go away. If a Nimitta comes, you try to maintain the Nimitta and hold on to it, don't let it go. Vipassana is different. The principle of Vipassana is to let go of everything. Whatever comes, you see, let go. Comes, you see, you let go. Right? Two different things, you know. So people who do Samatha first, very difficult for them to let go, to do Vipassana. Because it becomes very unsettling. Uh, because the mind is so peaceful and calm, you know. Suddenly you ask them to watch things come and go. Uh, and you become like a busy body, you know. Everywhere, all the five senses are being stimulated. <laughs> okay? Okay, so... What happens is people who are doing Samatha, before they get into very deep concentration, there's this transition state between normal consciousness and deeper sort of consciousness. In this transition state, there's a tendency for you to have hallucinations. Your mind is not really very alert. It's like half dreamy, you know. Uh, then you can hear things, you can see things coming and going. And then people who do not have a proper teacher or do not know the proper method, they might just latch on to these things and regard them as real. Right? And be deluded by these things. Or sometimes they have some schizophrenic potential within them. Then this becomes a second voice that tells them to do things and that talks to them. This voice will tell them to do this, to do that, and then they will follow uh, and do all sorts of funny things. There was one girl in Sumananjong. She was doing meditation very intensively until she got into this state. Lah. This voice was telling her to do all sorts of things, you know. One day the voice told her to strip naked and run in the meditation center. And that's what she did. So after that she was told not to meditate. 
and she went actually to seek psychiatric treatment also. Okay, anyone else? Ah, okay. How about people who suffer from depression, is it? Yeah, 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 I know, yes. So, in fact, uh, having said so much about schizophrenia, there's this very popular psychotherapy called ACT, which I've been talking about so often, acceptance and commitment therapy. At the moment, uh, the National Health Service in UK is popularizing this very much throughout the whole country. Now, they came out with a report which says that schizophrenic patients who have undergone some psychiatric treatment, after they've undergone psychiatric treatment and they're more stabilized, then they go through this ACT course which incorporates mindfulness practice. And they say that after going through this course, I don't know, just about the five-week course, uh, then it reduced their readmission by 30%. So it even works for schizophrenic patients, but they must go through medication first until they are more stable. Uh, then they are introduced to this uh, mindfulness technique. Also, it works very well for depression. People who suffer from depression. And there are facts and figures uh, to show how mindfulness, particularly of daily activities, coming back to the present moment, helps them to calm down and to emerge from their depression. In fact, if I'm not mistaken, I mean, you would have heard of Sadao Udejaniya, right? He was here before. In fact, he suffered from depression many times. And it was only through meditation that managed to pull him out of it. So with proper guidance, mindfulness meditation is good for depression. Okay, anyone else? Last question. No? Okay, yes. Radio. So, to forgive and forget is easier said than done. How to actually go about doing it? There are various ways of doing it. Eh? The Buddha in one sutta talks about how to get rid of grudges. This one way is to use compassion or loving kindness. Yeah. Or another thing is don't think of that person. <laughs> this doesn't really solve it. Lah. But I think one of the most potent things eh, is to contemplate on karma. The law of karma. There are two approaches that you can do. One is, if you feel that he is in a wrong, you could forgive him by saying that, well, he's the owner of his own karma. Somehow or other, karma will catch up with him. Right? Secondly, you could also reason out that it's probably because you did something similar like that to him in the past, in the past life. Uh, that's why he's doing this to you. So it's just like you are paying a debt. Let it be, lah. You know, I owe him one. Let him go, lah. Let it be. There's also another way. Through true reflection. Yeah. But actually, it's very powerful, you know, asking for forgiveness. Even forgiving yourself, not only forgiving others, it's more difficult to forgive yourself than to forgive others. If you're able to forgive yourself and forgive others, uh, that will help you a lot in your psychological health as well as your spiritual progress. Some people, they get stuck in spiritual progress uh, because of some past karmic things. So when we ask them to do forgiveness, if you have intentionally or unintentionally offended anyone in the whole length of samsara, then you ask for forgiveness. And if they have offended you in any way also, you forgive them. Absolutely. When you really do that genuinely with your whole heart, then it smoothens your path. Okay. Alright, I think uh, time to go.